Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for that introduction. Thanks to Neil, thanks to Anne, thanks to Lori, New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Uh, I mean, the first question you kind of have to ask about when writing about Robert Kennedy is why another book about Robert Kennedy? There are a lot of books. And one thing I wanted to understand was Robert Kennedy at the end of his life, uh, considered a political hero by many. and. Uh, I think one of the, what I wanted to explain was how he became that, how he got that way, and how do we get these political heroes? What are their developments? So I tried to approach it from sort of a, a contemporary uh, standpoint in writing these pieces as you went, uh, as they occurred in real time, month by month, sort of. And so I, to do that, I had to focus on a small period of his life. And this is the one I focused on. But uh, for those who, need a little bit of a grounding in Robert Kennedy again. Here he is, uh, born November 20th, 1925 in Brookline, Massachusetts. He was the seventh of nine. Uh, he was born eight years after his brother Jack, seven years before his brother Teddy. Uh, so as his mother would say in later years, he had two much older brothers, uh, one much younger, uh, so neither of, uh, and none of whom were good playmates for him. Uh, so he was a kid who was alone a lot of his life, of a lot of his early life. He later talked about attending many different schools, uh, more than he could remember. Uh, he lived his life in a lot of different places, Hyannisville, Bronxville, or Hyannisport, excuse me, Bronxville, Palm Springs, London. Uh, and... He was uh, sort of an outsider. He was awkward. And I think in later years, you see this Robert Kennedy many times as someone who understood what it was like to be apart from the rest. And he also valued and idealized his family. This is Jack Kennedy in 1941, and Bobby's just off to the side holding a shoe. He's wearing sun tape on his nose. This is two years before JFK becomes a war hero uh, in PT-109. Uh, his, Bobby's oldest brother, Joseph Patrick Kennedy uh, Jr., was killed in the war. Jack was badly injured. Uh, his other brother-in-law was killed. Bobby did not have a chance to serve uh, in action. He did serve in the Navy. Um, and he went on to go to Harvard, though, and, and lettered in football, and like his uh, brother's he dabbled in journalism. He went off to the University of Virginia for law school. And he married Ethel in 1950. Uh, he was the first Kennedy man to settle down. Uh, he was the first of his generation to have kids. Uh, Joseph Patrick Kennedy Sr., who you see there, uh, he would like to say of Bobby that he was the one who would keep the Kennedys together. Family really defined Robert Kennedy and for most of his professional life. So I just said he was in law school at UVA. Uh, he did not attend his graduation because he went to Massachusetts in 1952 to help his brother uh, run his Senate race. And he was a campaign manager in that race, and they won. And Bobby also won a reputation as a hard-driving taskmaster. He uh, was very tough on the, uh, what he saw as some lazier politicians in Massachusetts. He came away from his first uh, campaign experience with a low opinion of people in the political trade. Uh, he got a job in the Senate alongside his brother. He was uh, working for the Investigations Committee. He worked for Joe McCarthy, a Republican from Wisconsin, uh, very controversial for his statements on communism. and. Uh, is, I mean, McCarthyite is a thing. And so if, that, if you uh, come away with an ite after your name, you did not maybe uh, succeed in politics. He be but he became an investigator, and, and this sort of ruthless uh, reputation started to follow him. And also he continued to do what his brother needed him to do. In 1956, he uh, tried to help Jack 
secure the vice presidential nomination uh, for the Democratic Party. They lost that uh, bid, but uh, uh, Bobby joined Adlai Stevens' uh, presidential campaign to help learn how to operate a national uh, political organization, which was something that they thought JFK would need. Uh, the, the thing about the 56th convention, also to go back uh, to explain the, the vice presidential situation, the Democratic nominee, Adlai Stevenson, said, uh, I'll let the convention choose my nominee. Keep that in the back of your mind because this sort of situation is going to come up again. In 1960, Bobby went uh, all over the country working for his brother, uh, worked to the bone on the presidential race, uh, yet he still attended mass on Sundays. And that sort of showed this single-minded devotion that Bobby had would show again and again in his life. Uh, he, uh, Joseph Kennedy Sr. would say that Jack worked as hard as any mortal man can, Bobby works a little harder. And that was uh, the atmosphere that carried him through. They succeeded. In uh, 1960, JFK narrowly won the presidency, and Bobby didn't know what he wanted to do next. He had considered going to England or going to Harvard to study some. Uh, he did not really foresee an administration job, but his father did, and his father knew that JFK was going to need someone to be completely loyal, to give him the advice unvarnished and uh, to keep an eye out for his brother as well. Uh, they resisted, too. Uh, they sent their transition manager, Clark Clifford, down to Palm Beach to talk to Joseph Kennedy Sr., who explained very rationally why maybe it's not a great idea to put young Bobby in this role. And Joseph Kennedy replied, without malice, Bobby will be the attorney general. And so he was. Uh, JFK joked that when he was going to announce Bobby's appointment, he was going to poke his head out of his Georgetown home, look both ways down the street to see if any reporters were there and hopefully not there, and he was going to whisper, it's Bobby. Uh, but in reality, before they did this little press conference uh, for the reporters stationed outside his home, he had to tell Bobby to comb his hair. So that was the Attorney General of the United States. Uh, what did Robert Kennedy do as Attorney General? He uh, was heavily involved in foreign policy in Cuba, the Bay of Pigs crisis, the later the missile crisis, and also a budding crisis in Vietnam. Uh, he also had a major role in domestic politics, uh, in, in the general pol politics of the judi judiciary and uh, in the legal uh, battles, also civil rights, uh, very big immigration as well. Uh, Bobby was divisive because of this. And uh, he, you know, there were uh, favor seekers who would come to JFK asking for things, especially when he was in the Senate. JFK would meet with them in his office. They would ask for some sort of impossible demand. JFK would smile and he would nod and he would say, go, go see Bobby in the basement. Bobby uh, would then uh, meet these people in his office where he would tell them no. And that was the job. You had to have someone who was going to do that. But because of that, Bobby got this reputation. Um, and the uh, law professor Alexander Bickle put it this way, Robert was perceived as a tough guy, insensitive, cruel, vindictive, clannish, summed up in a word which he never shook off, ruthless. And that man in the far corner of that photo, Kenneth Keating, Republican senator, remember who he is, just over J. F. J. Edgar Hoover's shoulder. He's going to come back as well. So in the fall of 1963, Robert Kennedy thought he was politically toxic for his brother facing re-election in 1964, and that perhaps he should step away, resign as attorney general, maybe not go and be a campaign manager in 1964, uh, because people would still think he was involved, uh, still important, because he was saying that people were st starting to make it not Robert Kennedy did this, but the Kennedy brothers did this, and that was going to be uh, a hard thing to, a hurdle to clear. But JFK said no, 
he thought uh, they would be running out on, it would be perceived that they would be running out on civil rights and other tough fights. And he, uh, he told his brother he should stay. Uh, and so on this day, uh, November 20th, 1963, Bobby saw his brother, uh, agreed that he had to do what he had to do, uh, and went back to the Justice Department for a birthday party where he appeared to his colleagues as somewhat depressed and uh, upset about his current situation. But two days later, their worlds changed. Um, millions watched Robert Kennedy mourn, uh, and it was his first time without direction. Uh, oh, did my screen cut out? Sorry, we're actually gonna, we're gonna need this in a little bit too because, oh good, all right, great. So millions watched Robert Kennedy mourn, um, and as I was saying, it was his first time in his whole entire life without direction uh, because from the time he graduated law school, he would basically do what his brother needed him do, to do. He would work for his family's interests. And now he was the top person in his family. Uh, and he cared deeply about JFK's legacy and about preserving it. And uh, he was concerned that maybe LBJ wouldn't do so. Uh, and he was also concerned that LBJ would not take care of the people in the Kennedy orbit, uh, the people who had served his brother so loyally. Uh, he would tell people to get what you want because in 11 months we won't matter. And by 11 months he meant the 1964 presidential election. Uh, and the power was now with their political adversary, Bobby's political adversary to be particular, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And there you see Bobby just days after the assassination and the joint address to Congress. Uh, the New York Times wrote that his slight figure was the most moving sight inside the congressional chamber. Uh, he was depressed. People looked at him and they saw desolation. But he also knew he had to do something to keep in the mix. He had to keep power. And he really thought to seek it in the most conventional way. Um, earlier the morning of that video, it was two days after JFK's funeral, a young press aide in the Justice Department named Jack Rosenthal was going to work, and he spotted Bobby on his way in. And he was kind of shocked by this because he didn't think the Attorney General would be coming into the office that week. And then he was sort of relieved because Bobby didn't see him. And Jack Rosenthal, who was 28 years old, didn't know what to say to someone who had just lost their brother who happened to be the President of the United States. So Rosenthal goes to his desk, and all of a sudden he's called into the Attorney General's office. And he's there, his boss, Ed Guthman, who was Bobby's top press aide, was there. And they showed him the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, dead center in that day's edition was an article, Hopeful Air Pervades Capital as Officials Buckle Down to Jobs. It was a glowing review of Washington under LBJ and the transition of power except for one thing, uh, and this it says, but if some new frontiersmen were overcoming their despair, others were not. A Kennedy appointee at the Justice Department complained, it's pretty hard to identify with a Texas Wheeler dealer. Bobby Kennedy wanted to know who might have said this, if Jack could figure it out. Now Jack talked to the Wall Street Journal reporter pretty much on a daily basis, so he thought, give him a call. Now, the reporter that Jack talked to wasn't the byline in the story, and Jack thought it was a tough a task to be handed, but given the situation of everything that was going on, he'd try. He calls the reporter up. The reporter says, I'm sorry to tell you, Jack, it was you. Jack had described LBJ in the same exact language, except with an expletive. In 1963, they couldn't print an expletive in the Wall Street Journal, so they changed it to Wheeler Dealer. Um, now, so Jack went back and told him and thought he was going to be in a lot of trouble. RFK was relieved. And he said, oh, I thought it was this assistant attorney general. Uh, and Jack came away from that experience, Jack Rosenthal, with the question, why did he care? And he realized in later years that 
at that moment, just hours after burying JFK, Bobby was thinking about politics. Uh, and again, he was mourning deeply. And yet, December 5th, 1963, two weeks after the assassination, he asked Arthur Schlesinger, should I go for the vice presidency? Now, you may be asking, how is this possible? Uh, and that's going to need a primer in presidential succession. In 1963, this was the succession. You the President John F. Kennedy, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, Speaker of the House McCormick. And after Dallas, this was the line of succession. And that's uh, LBJ, McCormick, and Carl Hayden. This is all before the 25th Amendment uh, made it possible to fill the vice presidency. There was no constitutional way of filling this role. And uh, to make it even better, you had McCormick, who was 72 years old, and Hayden, who was 86 years old at the time, the Senate president pro tem. And the, the vice presidency would be vacant until the 64 election. Uh, this had happened not actually so long ago in history. When McKinley died in the first year of his second term, and when FDR died in the first year of his fourth term, the vice presidency was vacant for all of this time. An advisor to Bobby actually wrote a memo about this, Fred, named Fred Dutton, about the vice presidential uh, line of succession and how these people had gone about getting this office. And the main point of his memo was the president's choice, typically in these situations like these, do not uh, get carried through. Um, LBJ had the biggest say on who was going to be his vice presidential nominee. There's no question about that. But at the end of the day, it was the delegates of the Democratic National Convention who were going to decide. And at that time, the delegates were the power brokers of the party. The primaries had begun, and they had even gotten some more uh, relevance after JFK made uh, some impressive showings and used the primaries to show his electability in the 1960 cycle. But the primaries were still sort of uh, regional and uh, not, so, not so binding. It was still the power brokers but they could make a point. And so I'm gonna take you inside some of my research now and, uh, and show you some things. But this is a memo from an assistant attorney general, attorney general named John Douglas. He was the son of a senator from Illinois. Uh, and he typed it up himself. You can sort of see it's a little messy. And uh, in the memo uh, from January 6, 1964, just after the new year, he uh, explained to him the rules of the New Hampshire primary and the qualifications and he wrote that uh, the preference primary is for candidates for both president and vice president. And he underlined vice president twice. Now, uh, Douglas wrote to Bob atop this memo, think about this, John, and signed it. But, you know, so what? It's a memo. People get memos. You write memos. You send them. doesn't mean that their device is taken. But RFK initialed it. Uh, which signaled to his secretary, I'd read this, I reviewed this, okay. I found this in his attorney general's papers uh, up down in Boston. Uh, so again, so what? Bobby's aware that there's a write-in in New Hampshire for vice president uh, in their primary. Moving forward, January 8th, Robert Kennedy gives an interview to the New York Times uh, in which he says that he will stay as attorney general there was some speculation that he would leave, uh, that after JFK, he felt he was you know, no longer uh, serving this, the president that he had gone to Washington with and might move on. Uh, the calendar from this day, from Bobby's desk diary at the Attorney General's office. Uh, if you take a closer look here, you see 11.30, Tony Lewis, that's Anthony Lewis of the New York Times, the person he had given the interview to. See a joint session of Congress there, 12.05. Uh, and then at 1.30, luncheon at House, Peter Crotty. And who is Peter Crotty? Peter Crotty was a power broker, uh, one of those people who'd have a lot of sway at the Democratic National Convention. He was the boss of Buffalo, New York, Erie County, which was uh, the 15th or 16th largest metropolitan area at the time from the biggest Democratic delegation uh, to the, de sorry, biggest de uh, delegation to the Democratic Convention. Uh, and two weeks later, 
Erie County endorsed Robert Kennedy for vice president. Now, uh, they were the first in the country to do so. Uh, they were, uh, uh, two weeks later, uh, not two weeks later, excuse me, a few days later, uh, they had a state dinner for the Democratic Party in which Peter Crotty and some others tried to organize a endorsement by the entire New York State delegation of Robert Kennedy as vice president, which would have been huge uh, going forward. Crotty said his whole idea was to create a national wave in support of Bobby as vice president. And in a way, he sort of succeeded. This is Governor John King of New Hampshire, 1962. Uh, John King was a Democrat, uh, which was rare for New Hampshire in those days. Uh, he had a priority, uh, passing a state lottery, which was uh, unique in the country at the time. And they passed it through the state house in 1963, in that first lottery since 94, that's 1894 uh, there. This is from the New York Times from 1963. Uh, but it was subject to approval the way that the law was written. It was subject to approval by local jurisdictions. They needed to have a vote. The vote, the next available vote was March 10, 1964, the New Hampshire primary. And there was a competitive Republican primary that year, and there wasn't a Democratic one. His advisors were well aware of this, as memos and other documents show. And a little closer look, because this memo is hard to read on the screen. But that's uh, to Governor King from Bill Dunphy, uh, William Dunphy, uh, an advisor, uh, out, out, informal advisor, outside advisor to Governor King. And he wrote you know, about how there was going to be probably well over 100,000 Republicans going to the polls on March 10th, uh, as many as 125,000. And with present developments, there will only be anywhere from 18 to 25,000 Democrats. This is late January 1964. And he recognizes uh, Peter Crotty's endorsement of Bobby up in Buffalo. And he says, we've had, you know, we, we need to have some conversations about a well-planned effort on behalf of the Attorney General here in New Hampshire. Because it could be a stimulant, bring out another 25 or 30,000 votes. Uh, so they, you know, they realized RFK could help them. And if you look in RFK's phone messages just a few days later, February 4, 1964, you see uh, Bernie Booten calls, uh, another New Hampshire political figure he, who was down working in Washington as part of the administration, uh, wanted to schedule a uh, meeting with Bobby. And you see there on the side, 3 o'clock, Fe February 10, 1964, they scheduled a meeting. Uh, while all this was going on, a man named Paul Corbin, and this is Paul Corbin in 1960, he's the guy wearing the suit with the jacket on. Uh, not a lot of photos of Paul Corbin, I would have had a better one for you. But uh, Paul was a, this is sort of typical, this scene of how Paul operated in politics. He was kind of like a carnival barker. He went into tough situations uh, in which they would not, not want to send you back ever again to get the job done. Usually when there was a democratic organization that wasn't doing so well uh, and, they, and they didn't want to upset the local power brokers, they'd send in Paul, he'd organize the Republicans, the independents, and get that operation going. Uh, he worked in Wisconsin, here he is, this is Janesville, and he actually got Paul Ryan's uncle involved in getting a uh, JFK fundraiser started there in 1959, this photo is taken. Uh, West Virginia and New York State, um, he couldn't get a job in the Department of Justice when JFK won because he had a long record with the FBI, he had associations with communists, so Bobby put him at the DNC. Bobby loved him. He was considered Bobby's guy. He was at that dinner with New York State officials that I mentioned earlier where they were trying to get them to endorse Bobby. Uh, and actually, Corbin being there might be a reason why they failed because uh, Corbin at the DNC, one of his things that he kept an eye on was New York, and he had a big flag, a big map of New York in the, on his wall, and in each county he had flags. Uh, blue flags were for leaders he liked, the county leaders he liked. Red flags were for leaders he thought needed to go, and most of his flags were red. So but he might not have been the person to convince them to endorse Bobby, but he was Bobby's guy at the DNC. In Late January, early February 1964, Paul Corbin shows up in New Hampshire. He works with a local ad man, he buys 
uh, campaign ads for Bobby. He starts pushing, trying to organize vice presidential write-in push for Bobby. This does not sit well with the president of the United States. Uh, LBJ is now in control of the DNC. He doesn't like a DNC officer, the special assistant to the chairman, going to uh, New Hampshire and working for a vice presidential candidate. He wants to seem fair. So after a meeting with Bobby in the Oval Office, he pulls him aside and says, Paul Corbin's in New Hampshire. Get him out of there or make him quit the DNC. Bobby says, I don't know what you're talking about. And, uh, and they have a little back and forth. LBJ is calling people, selling them to make phone calls with recorders on so that he has proof. And then uh, uh, Bobby keeps denying, uh, eventually says, you know, if you want to fire him, then you fire him. I'm not going to do your job for you. And they have a really tough uh, battle. Bobby always played this game, though. As one of his aides, Walter Sheridan, used to say, he would say, Paul who? You know, he, ha he liked to keep a, a level of distance between himself and Corbin. And Corbin talks about this in his oral history interviews with the JFK Library, that Bobby would always deny knowledge of what he was doing. But he felt he did. But LBJ got his way. In February, uh, they said that Corbin had resigned from the Democratic National Committee. Uh, and then in, uh, in March, on the day of the New Hampshire primary, the story came out uh, that Corbin was fired and RFK remained strangely adamant over the years. Even, even later, he did a, a oral history project in May of 1964 in which he said, Paul Corbin never went to New Hampshire. This was, kind of, this was after everyone had acknowledged that Paul Corbin had gone to New Hampshire. His brother-in-law, Steve Smith, was aware that he had gone to New Hampshire. I always find it strange. There are still Paul Corbin oral histories uh, under seal at the Kennedy Library. So there are two of them left. I'm hopeful that one day that will come out, what exactly Paul Corbin was doing in New Hampshire and who knew in 1964. But um, consider that the days that RFK was having a conversation with LBJ and about New Hampshire, he was getting this kind of information into his office. And now you see these phone logs, but luckily sometimes they don't get him and they leave a message. And that's like a bingo for historians because we're able to see what they were trying to say to each other. And Charlie Bartlett, who is a columnist in Washington, uh, he called uh, Bobby to let him know that a local delegate had filed at the last minute for an alternate uh, space to the Democratic National Convention. Charlie says there was no publicity on it. It's an awful lot of information for someone who doesn't know what's going on in New Hampshire. And that's one of the things that makes me question how much Bobby knew. Because then a few days after his fight with LBJ over uh, Paul Corbin, he's getting messages like this from Bernie Booten. Now, he had taken the meeting with Bernie Booten. Uh, and then, so I'll read you the message. Bernie Booten called. He talked to Ted after seeing you, Ted Kennedy. Ted completely agreed with the conclusions that you discussed. He has been in touch with New Hampshire, and everything is in operation. There's no problem. He thinks they will be able to take care of everything. And what were they taking care of? Well, Governor King soon after endorsed Bobby for the vice presidency. The entire state committee endorsed Bobby for the vice presidency uh, in the New Hampshire primary in 1964. The state party encouraged their uh, local representatives to turn out the vote for Bobby, and they, they uh, supported him, and they paid for advertisements. Uh, and they capitalized on this sentiment for JFK. They were trying to uh, really pass their lottery sweepstakes. And uh, LBJ got some support from them too. You saw in that letter that they were also saying, write in LBJ for president. But it was almost like LBJ became Bobby's running mate in this 1964 New Hampshire primary. In fact, the Boston Globe's political editor wrote at the time that it was likely, uh, just days before the race, that Bobby was going to get more votes for vice president than LBJ was going to get for president. And uh, so, <laughs> Understandably, LBJ was going nuts over this. Uh, and he was scouring for intelligence uh, on Bobby and Bobby's actions. He knew where Bobby was having lunch those days. And you'll see, uh, it's pretty evident where he was getting his information from, from the FBI, because I'm about to play a clip for you uh, in which uh, it was a long conversation with LBJ and his aide, Bill Moyers, there. <laughs> 
Uh, it was 13 minutes long. There was a two and a half minute redaction. It's from the night before the New Hampshire primary in 1964. And I filed a, a, a deed request on it and they cleared it and they released it to me. And so not a lot of people have heard this. Uh, probably like this is the most people who've ever heard it. <laughs> and uh, he, Moyers had just read LBJ an article about the New Hampshire primary. Uh, and I'll, I'll play you their reaction, which they've recorded and which they redacted for the last 40 years. I have been the only three campaign. Well, he was sweet, but I think we would just write it out, take a little time, and he made an ass of himself. That's what it was just. Yeah. I still think that one of you don't have an organization that is lost in the country who was So to sum up, the, because the governor of New Hampshire wanted a lottery, the president of the United States almost fired the attorney general. And um, what happened next? That was the night before the New Hampshire primary. This is what happened. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. won the Republican primary in a uh, write-in vote all the way from Saigon. He was the uh, US ambassador to South Vietnam at the time. And the Kennedy story kind of got bumped from being the top thing to, you see down there, Kennedy trails Johnson in write-in vote. Uh, Bobby trailed LBJ by about 4,000 votes. Um, in the end, it, it was a presidential write-in and there was a vice presidential write-in. But if you uh, look at the others, uh, Hubert Humphrey, Sergeant Shriver, Adlai Stevenson, Ed Muskie, and Teddy Kennedy, you'll see that Bobby really blew the others away. And that kind of, some. Uh, is in line with how the public polling was at the time. The rank and file Democrats wanted Bobby as the vice presidential nominee. And uh, Bobby did more uh, in this presidential, uh, vice presidential search quest that he had. Uh, you know, one of the most interesting things I found was these receipts for speech lessons. In January of 1964, he started taking public speaking lessons. Uh, and uh, he would fly up to New York uh, where he had a, 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 a speech teacher. Her mother had taught Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, he would sometimes do it with other business, sometimes not. And in, like the day before this speech, this was Scranton, uh, his St. Patrick's Day speech, his first major political speech after his brother's assassination. Uh, there's more of Bobby's traveling around the country uh, as a... Uh, uh, strategically traveling, I should say, because there, uh, one aide wrote out a memo of go here this weekend, go there this weekend. And again, so what people write memos, 
but it matters when people follow the advice. And Bobby see, followed the advice almost perfectly. Uh, and Lyndon Johnson had lots to fear of Bobby's political power uh, because at the convention, it could be susceptible to these sorts of movements, these, uh, these uh, demonstrations on the floor that could just you know, sweep away what he wanted for his choice. And so here was the Democratic National Convention in 1964. Uh, you see the stage, uh, the political editor of the Boston Globe said, well, there's the Democratic ticket, Johnson and Johnson. Uh, they held the balloting. Yeah, Hubert Humphrey was the pick for vice president, and they held the balloting uh, in which the delegates vote uh, all before this. And this is Robert Kennedy introducing the memorial film to JFK. They pushed it back in the week because LBJ knew what was going to happen. Mary McGrory, a columnist, wrote a story about this. And uh, the morning is saying that they were pushing it back to Thursday because they're worried about the balloting. Uh, demonstration for, J for RFK and JFK. And there's a tape of LBJ talking to one of his aides saying, Mary McGrory got our, got our story, you know, who do you reckon leaked it? So you, we, that's how we know that. But um, LBJ's instincts were absolutely correct because it was a mob scene. There was a, as many know, an ovation for over 12 minutes of Bobby. Um, and you know, a lot has been said about that speech, about what he said that night. But I think the fact that he had that long ovation where people were just stamping and cheering and, and clapping for him all night long uh, is the most important thing. Um, this is a photo you know, with Bobby's eyes rimmed red taken by a photographer named Steve Shapiro. He's the guy who um, took the photo that's on the cover of my book. And it's on the, the Kennedy campaign poster that you see out in the hallway. Steve took that photo as well. I asked Steve about uh, the convention. He was there and he said he took this photo and he, uh, developed it and saw that he was crying and he put it in a drawer and after Bobby died they published a special edition of Look magazine and in which they uh, they use this photo um, to but to talk about Robert Kennedy's progression more beyond this this vice presidential episode I'll go to another magazine cover this life magazine and you see the future ambassador to Japan sitting on his lap there Caroline Kennedy uh, Bobby was the patriarch of the Kennedy family after this. Uh, he would say that the first four of his family were gone. Uh, Joseph Kennedy had died. Jack had died. Uh, their sister, Rosemary, was, uh, was rendered mute by a botched operation. Uh, it, and Kit Kennedy had died as well. And he understood his place in the family and how that factored into his decisions and how much change they could handle. And so June of 1964, take a step back, Robert Kennedy had been considered a candidate for, vice, uh, for the New York U.S. Senate nominee, the Democratic nominee that year. There was a Republican senator in New York, and Bobby was under consideration. Uh, then Ted Kennedy was in a plane crash. The pilot was killed instantly. Uh, one of Teddy's aides was mortally wounded. Uh, Teddy was pulled from the wreckage. Bobby was in Hyannis. Uh, state trooper came to the door, said, Teddy's been in an accident. We don't know how serious it is. You come with us. So they, did, they went, and Teddy uh, was going to be in, was in very severe shape, and they were going to have to uh, uh, keep him in a frame for many months. And so you see that photo of Robert Kennedy there. And here he is, Northampton. Massachusetts wandering the ground, saying somebody up there doesn't like me, and decides his, his brother-in-law had been running a, uh, uh, a campaign, a, laying the groundwork, realist about the vice presidency, saying this is not going to happen. So he is seeking out these New York power brokers. Maybe we'll run for the Senate seat. Bobby says no. And a month later, Lyndon Johnson rules out Bobby. He makes all these sorts of funny calls to members of his cabinet to say, hey, just so you know, you're not going to be vice president. They're literally laughing at him. And uh, Jack Valenti, one of his aides, says to the president that night, well, you, got, you really got rid of them all. And he said, only had to eliminate one. And that was Bobby. Uh, Bobby took a, a couple days to think about it and decided to go off to New York. And so a Virginia resident who voted in Massachusetts uh, became the New York uh, Democratic nominee for U.S. Senate in a matter of weeks. It was a rough transition 
Here's the Fulton Fish Market. Bobby was a little bit of an awkward candidate, but uh, he could really attract the crowds. And here he is in Coney Island in 1964, early in the campaign. You can sort of see he looks wooden in this photo, and that's true. Uh, he was an awkward guy uh, by nature. He, <laughs> you know, you talk about the Jeb Bush please clap moment. Bobby actually had one of those in this 1964 race where he, people didn't understand where he was landing, so he said, please clap now. Uh, people struggled to hear him, but they really, it wasn't about hearing him, it was about seeing him. And they would tear at him. Uh, they had a strategy for keeping him in the car. You could see one aide would hold on to his belt, another aide would be wrapped around his knees to brace for this. It was grueling physically. Uh, Bobby met with his uh, schedulers early in the campaign, and he re they say hello to him. They don't recognize him. He reaches out with his left hand with his pinky because the rest of his hands were so puffy and bruised and bleeding. And he said, this is what I wanted to talk to you about. He'd been overscheduled, and he said, I can do it. I'm just not going to be able to think straight. But, you know, people needed this release in 1964. They had suffered a great tragedy in losing his brother. Many of them felt personally connected uh, to that trauma. And so Bobby would go out there and he'd expose himself to people. Uh, he would say, it makes me feel like a beetle. Um, but, and it was really the reason he stood a chance in this race. Because this man, Ken Keating, has pink cheeks, white hair, uh, Bobby said he, you know, looked like a grandfather. He also said that he was very grandfatherly towards him when he was in this, uh, when he was attorney general and they were working together with Republicans in the Senate. Uh, he was a liberal, an authentic liberal. In 1964, he had uh, rejected Goldwater. He had walked out of the Republican National Convention. And, uh, you know, he had, he had a, he was a formidable candidate in a formidable year. Um, this is actually Keating's record. This is from a Keating flyer. Uh, you know, he won seven consecutive races, and this is how he cast RFK's experience. Appointed, 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 rejected candidate for vice presidency, handpicked by the bosses. Uh, and, you know, this was going right at Bobby Kennedy's ruthless image that we talked about earlier. Uh, and the idea was Bobby's not running for Senate, Bobby's running for president, he just can't run for president right now, so he's going to use you. And it was a good message the stepping stone, which kind of became the watchword for this, it was a stumbling block for Bobby, uh, who was, you know, struggled to getting his message out, to, to re rebuff these uh, attacks. Uh, but he thrived in question and answer sessions. And uh, he needed these interactions. It was sort of called back to his experience as a prosecutor. Ask a question, get an answer. He couldn't really go on for a speech. And so they cut ads of him taking questions like this. Why New York? You know, Keating had attacked him on civil rights, saying that he should have stayed to see the implementation of the bill. Uh, the whole thing about, is he running for president on our watch? Uh, and so there was, uh, there was that. And I, there's a lot more about the Senate I could talk about, but I want to talk about one thing that's actually not in my book, and it's this debate drama. Well, the debate drama is in this book. There's a specific moment that I didn't include in the book. Uh, they were, couldn't agree on debates. They each rented a half hour here and a half hour there, side by side. They were, uh, the original intent was to mix them together and debate each other. When they couldn't agree, they each decided, we'll do a half hour, you do a half hour. Keating says, Bobby won't debate me. And he had an empty chair and a lectern that said Bobby Kennedy on it. And uh, Bobby decided to show up three minutes before air and say, I'm here to debate. Uh, so at 7.28, Bobby shows up, CBS, the executives and the security say, you can't go in, you see that sign, please keep out, no visitors, Keating. I don't know if the Kennedy campaign put that sign up, but um, because it's so perfect to illustrate his point of Bobby outside. After this, this farce goes on, and they know this is gonna be the front pages of all the newspapers, which it was, Keating literally is chased out of the auditorium by reporters. Uh, who run down the hallway. And one reporter from Newsday named Myron Walden says he topples over a couch. You could see the couch that they'd pulled out there uh, and falls onto his back. And who flies over him but his younger, more athletic colleague named Robert Caro, who we now know as the Lyndon Johnson chronicler and one of the greatest historians of our time. 
Uh, now, I asked Robert Caro about this story. Mike Waldman died 20 years ago. I asked Caro about the story. He said it wasn't true, so I didn't include it in my book. But it's a great picture, and I just love the image of Robert Caro leaping over the couch. He did have a byline on this story, though. Um, so Robert Kennedy won. This is actually the scene from his election night in 1964, him shaking hands with LBJ. He really rode his coattails in many ways. Bobby won with 54% of the vote. Uh, LBJ won in New York State with just under 69% of the vote. So there's a huge drop off. Bobby said, now I can go back to being ruthless. Political reporters laughed and then sort of thought maybe he's believable in that. Um, he went to the Senate. This is his freshman class. You see Walter Mondale up there this, uh, and the leadership of the Senate at the time. Bobby was ranked 99 out of 100. And yet he was the most watched man in the Senate. He was this celebrity senator. Uh, and in doing that, uh, he was judged kind of on a tough curve. Uh, he was back to his old form in Senate hearings, tough, prosecutorial. The Washington Post said that he treated auto executives like teenagers flunking their driver's ed course. Uh, but Senate work was not his forte. And so senators presided in the Senate much, uh, much of the time. That was their job. Uh, you see these hours logged here. Um, Teddy, 51 minutes because Teddy was in a striker frame for the year, uh, for had been at least, and uh, was still recovering from his back. Uh, his secretary, he writes a note to his secretary, the AMN, Angie Novello. I didn't do too well, did I? Nope. Uh, but that was Bobby. And I, I think this story, this photo gives you an idea of his reputation at the time in 1965. Uh, the morning of LBJ's inauguration, uh, Bobby Kennedy and Teddy uh, get in the car, they drive out to Washington, they stop by Arlington National Cemetery on their way there, they pay their respects at JFK's grave. They go to the inauguration, they witness the ceremony that they had last witnessed four years earlier in which their brother had taken the oath of office uh, I imagine it was an emotional time for uh, the brothers. Bobby returns on his way home, passes Arlington, which the way he went to work and came to work. Uh, he stops again, and this time there was a camera there. Uh, and a photographer took a picture. It ended up in the newspaper the next day. A anonymous senior senator said, we're a pretty hard-boiled crowd. We notice stuff like that. They were saying that Bobby was using his brother's grave as a photo op. Uh, that's how Bobby was considered. And uh, I think that's how you have to judge some of his actions at this time. Because it affected even how he treated Vietnam. And, uh, you know, this I find so creepy that they dedicated this bus to JFK in the cabinet room. And so he was looming over their decisions, over the deliberations while they were talking about Vietnam, in some ways his legacy. Uh, I think the men in that room looked at that bust and saw different things in the reflection. Uh, but Robert Kennedy had long been in private conversations and memos with LBJ, urging a political solution in Vietnam, saying focus on the government. And uh, LBJ had a very different idea. About, it was about the military. RFK kept pushing this idea. In 1966, the Fulbright hearings happened. Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, said something interesting about elections. Bobby saw this as taking his chance to speak. And Bobby went out and uh, gave a speech about how we should include the National Liberation Front, the, the political arm of the Viet Cong, in a share of the power and responsibility. He didn't think it was that big of a deal. He went to Vermont to go skiing, and he was attacked by the media, by his former colleagues in the Kennedy administration, by the Republicans, by everyone from all sides. And one of the main takeaways was it was a personal thing. Bobby didn't, it wasn't about policy. It was about Bobby seeing a weakness in LBJ. Bill Buckley, William F. Buckley wrote about this, 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 this situation saying that Bobby is, you know, the, the forerunner of this political movement becoming in vogue. So that's Robert Kennedy I, up to 1966. And so I want to, but I want to give you something a little bit inspiring about him as well, about what he learned in this period. And I think really what Robert Kennedy took away wasn't that he was a better Catholic or that he read Greek poetry. I think it was that he learned change. Uh, he understood change better. 
It was something he spoke often of in this period. Um, because in this period, Robert Kennedy's life was changed. Uh, you know, he had lost direction. He had direction before, he lost it. He had power before, gone in an instant. You know, Americans were about to go through a period of, of revolutionary change, and Robert Kennedy talked to young people in the country about how that pace was quickening. He often talked about how for centuries, the speed of travel had only gone from walking to riding a horse. And now 60 years after Kitty Hawk, after in flight, uh, two men were orbiting the earth above them. He gave this speech in 1965 to, to college students. And this speech kind of went on. You know, he, uh, and, and in his very presence, he was a person, a leader who looked like and sounded like the person who had led them into the decade, but who wore the hair of someone who had actually seemed to learn from it. Uh, and in 1965, he gave that speech called The Revolution Now in Progress. And that speech, over time, he would give it in South America and all over in California, in Alabama, in Virginia, in New York. And it developed into something that he later talked about in South Africa, and which became really the epitaph of his life. And that's, each time a man stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. An aide said that uh, three years earlier, Robert Kennedy could not have imagined himself hopping on top of a car and singing We Shall Overcome with students fighting apartheid. And yet, that's where he was in June of 1966. And so uh, I'd like to close with a quote that he also gave in a magazine interview at this time about politics for the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. Um, he was asked about his children and he said, if you ask me whether I would like to see one or all of my sons in politics someday, the answer is yes. I would do nothing to influence or push them into it, but I would be pleased if it happened. Politics can hurt badly but there are lots of other ways of getting hurt in life. Thank you. So I guess I'm gonna take a few questions. Uh, the microphones, please. Sure. Thank you for that uh, uh, for that uh, presentation. Really right on and really good and very memorable. My only uh, question was: I'd, I thought that you you were going to cover more of uh, RFK's life after uh, you know uh, the uh, the in his later years, and you kind of ended it at uh, 1965, and he you know he got shot in 1968, and I was just looking for something else there, sir. Sure. Uh, I think Robert Kennedy's life, you can understand uh, part of his refusal to enter the 1968 New Hampshire primary. Uh, judge that based on his Vietnam speech and how he was responded to in 66. Uh, I think you can understand some of Robert Kennedy's hesitation uh, in getting into that race. And I think you can also understand what Robert Kennedy was getting at as far as talking to the outsiders. Uh, you know, he, he, there's this great photo I love of him uh, and George McGovern and Quentin Burdick at Wounded Knee at the memorial. And you see him uh, taking time from the campaign trail to talk to people who really aren't a significant voting bloc, uh, but who had suffered. And I think Robert Kennedy understood suffering, and I think he understood change. And I think you can really uh, get that from looking at even a small part of that transition of his life. Because I think the ruthless Robert Kennedy of 1963 and the Robert Kennedy who began running for president in 1968 for sure, 1967 becoming pushing more, I think there's a, a wide gap between them. And I think you can better understand how he got to that point uh, by looking at those years.
and looking at that transition, looking at how he sought power. I mean, what we talked about tonight, in many ways, was how he sought power through a conventional mean, through really the mean that ended not long after those years of uh, the Democratic conventions and the Republican conventions deciding who are our party's leaders. Now the, the people decide who our party's leaders are, for the most part. Uh, I think that change uh, is a story worth telling. I, um, I, sorry, I, I don't want to keep on this, but you know, from uh, power to protest, I thought, I don't know, I thought, I mean, uh, uh, please don't get me wrong. Did sir. you read my book? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good presentation, but I thought I thought we were going to get more into the. You could read the last 66, the last, 67, 68. Read uh, the last four chapters of my book. Yeah, you know, when we're talking talk about protest in the in the in the in the, uh, in the protest that uh, that occurred, you know, 68, 69, uh, 70 into the early 70s. Yeah, I, I, I just thought we were going to hear more of that, but. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's there is more protest in the book. There's definitely. Uh, the chance of uh, hey hey LBJ and all that, and the protester getting dragged out of the I think it was the Waldorf Astoria at an LBJ speech where Bobby was at. Just just check check out the book. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question. Hey Neil. <laughs> I never get to ask a question. Uh, just a couple of things too. That uh, that's John King right there in the LBJ picture that you mentioned. He. Um, he was a faculty member at St. Anselm College uh, and, a, and a huge contributor to this uh, institution. Uh, the other thing is that Bernie Booten, who was in all those memos, we honored here. He was a, a person who came down quite a bit. He was sharp as a tack to the end. And if he were here, he'd be able to completely <laughs> fill in all these gaps. And uh, we used to have him here, and it was great uh, before he passed away. So here's my question. I sort of alluded to this earlier. Um, I have a theory that if, L if, if RFK had just resigned and had let LBJ do what he needed to do as president, uh, from the right or from the pro-war side, LBJ probably wouldn't have felt this pressure to keep up with this Kennedy uh, what Kennedy started in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. He alludes to it many times in the phone conversations. And um, I almost believe that he, uh, LBJ dug us deeper into Vietnam because RFK was just sitting there on the wings and really annoying LBJ and he felt he had to keep up with this Kennedy, um, uh, what Kennedy started. So do you believe that and how do you feel about that? I think that's an excellent point. Uh, especially those early years, LBJ did not want to seem weaker than JFK did. Uh, and I think he might not have trusted the advice he was getting from Bobby, that maybe Bobby was going to double cross him by pushing him. You know, Bobby had volunteered to be the ambassador to South Vietnam in June of 1964. It's a very, uh, it's one of those overlooked moments in history. It's in the book. Uh, I dug into it as much as I could, and no one really had a good explanation for why. One of my theories is that he was trying to prove to LBJ how loyal he could be to him, that he would go out there. But I, I also do think that Bobby wasn't going there as an, volunteering to go there as an empty gesture. I think he felt that they needed a stronger figure uh, on the diplomatic front. I don't think he could have convinced LBJ, though, that that's maybe how he really felt, that he wanted to see that LBJ deep down thought he was very paranoid, and you get that sense. Uh, wanted to see uh, that by, LBJ believed Bobby wanted to see him stumble. And so I could see that uh, very much so. As we go on and as Bobby is pushing against, I think LBJ gets so dug in too that that consideration sort of flies away uh, as we're talking about 66, 67. But especially early on, absolutely. He was trying to be as tough as possible. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thanks for coming. The, uh, the New Hampshire part was really special. We never get that, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jack. Hi, I'm Jim Townsend, a retired attorney. And uh, before I was an attorney, we taught at the Putney School, and Kathleen Kennedy was a senior at Putney the year after her dad was, was assassinated. 
Uh, I assume you've seen the uh, Ken Burns movie about Vietnam, and and it, a, a fair amount of it was devoted to uh, the uh, Al Lowenstein dump LBJ movement. Uh, do you cover that in the book? What R, what RFK was doing? He must have had some communications with this movement. Yeah, there were communications. Al Lowenstein was uh, was. I mean, it, it's Al Lowenstein was pretty out in the open about what he was trying to do, yeah. and he uh, had a lot of uh, sympathies from people who were in Kennedy's orbit. Adam Walensky almost quit. Uh, Adam Walensky was speechwriter for Bobby, uh, probably his most influential speechwriter, uh, was about to leave the uh, Kennedy's operation and go off and work in this in the anti-war movement yeah. because of it. And uh, no, Bobby was really hampered by what he ended up doing um, by what he believed was a personality clash between him and LBJ. Uh, and, and that's really, it also fed into that ruthless image again of Bobby going in and seizing uh, McCarthy's victory and taking it away from him uh, mm. by then running for president after he proved that LBJ was uh, vulnerable. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. Oh, oh okay. Hi. Hey. Um, I was just curious, uh, what do you think the main differences between Jack and Bobby are, and why do you think those differences occurred? Politically and yeah. otherwise. No, you know, it, it's almost like their family was uh, very much structured by seniority, and uh, JFK was the... Uh, Anointed one, he was taller. He was he, just in the physical sense. He seemed to be more of a, of have a projection, whereas Bobby um, did not make good first impressions. He, he he won people over as he went along, but it was a tough uh, a battle for him. He wasn't as effortlessly cool. He had a hard time shrugging things off, being uh, having that sort of uh, sarcastic wit. Bobby had a sarcastic wit, but it was maybe a little bit more cutting than Rye, and uh, also JFK, while Bobby was ambitious, Bobby didn't really have a, uh, a goal in the same way that JFK had as the presidency. Bobby's goal was, was serving, and so I think that affects you know, who he was going to be. Uh, you know, people have called the two of them um, you know, the romantic disguise as an idealist, and the idealist described as a romantic. I think you could see uh, you see a lot in the brothers um, that is similar, uh, but for the most part, I think you see Bobby being someone who is a little bit uh, more willing to take risks, and uh, and you see that especially in the end of his life. So thank you so much. Thanks. <clears throat> I've always been surprised about his serving on the McCarthy hearings. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I prefer his later humanitarian version of himself. Did he ever express regret at having done that? He would often say, especially during his 64 campaign, that I disagreed with what the committee was doing and so I left it, but he wasn't, I, but I won't condemn him personally. And he said, it's the easiest thing in the world I could do is uh, score points and uh, take him down a peg but I won't because I, I think he w felt sorry for him. I think Bobby felt that McCarthy had been misled. I think he for sure disliked what the committee had done and disagreed with what it had done. Uh, and he made that very plain. But as far as uh, uh, taking on McCarthy personally, he wasn't willing to do that. And he you know, attended his funeral in secret, uh, was um, I think felt a lot of sorrow he was a, a, a person who understood uh, misfits, and I think he felt McCarthy was a misfit. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so I, I guess I'll be signing some books back there, and thank you all for coming, I really appreciate it. Thank you.